ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause and standing ovation for the one and only Pastor A. Oh my goodness, maybe it's not too late for me to be a, a rock star. <laughs> Past tense, okay. Uh, by the way, I really, God is in the, in the house and he's doing such powerful things. Uh, thank you to BMF, you guys are just amazing. Uh, you're just godly, godly people, I love them. I'm going to invite uh, the pastor for Lifeway Network, <laughs> Pastor Gordy. <laughs> To just come up on stage. Woo! He's a good man. Yeah. And you have a testimony for us with somebody from Lifeway that has to do with this event and uh, Free the Future. So maybe you just call him up and then you can help us figure out that story. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, good. This is still morning. Good morning, everyone. There is so much joy in this place. It's so tangible. Oh, come on. Come on. <laughs> and the word that was spoken in the morning was, we will overcome. They overcame by the, word of the, by the blood of the Lamb and the, the word, word of, of their testimony. testimony. So this is one of our guys who is a discipleship group leader. He has really supported ministry for so long. Uh, he's one of the key leaders in the church. We always speak this into his life and over his life that he's, he has the gift of giving. He has given over and above uh, uh, the bare minimum, over and above the tithes, over and above the sacrificial giving to just ensure that the ministry continues. And so without, without further ado, Mavuno, Mavuno Church, hey, I'm like Mavuno Life, Mavuno Church, like without you. further ado, help me welcome Martin Moirore. Oh, Mato. <laughs> Come on, Mato. Come on. <laughs> he, he was in the first cohort of uh, Fearless Institute. He published his book. He's done everything, guys. And he's one of the exemplary leaders in our community. And he's an assessor this season. Come on, Fearless Institute 2022. <laughs> And so, and so Martin has a testimony about uh, the, the Free the Future. He was in the gathering last year in November, and he got the word, and of course acted on it, went ahead and uh, acted in ob ob in sw with swift obedience. Yeah. I don't want to steal the shine. Martin, just share with us. Which version? <laughs> <laughs> From the top. Uh, so in November last year, we came to the gathering, Actually, life was just coming for a bash. Eh? We, like we took, we, we hired a bus. We came as we were just coming to have fun. Eh? And then, Pastor M gave us the word of the season, which was, uh, "We are getting out of debt by September 2022, and for you to activate the word of the season, it's give your first fruit." So this is something that I've, I had been having in my heart. So I just thought, okay, sour. But nowadays, you know, if you have a wife, you uh, make the decision, but you ask for permission. Eh? <laughs> when did you get married? <laughs> to put it into perspective. I, I got married in September this last year. Oh, come on now. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> we we learned quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so, I had to, so I had to go talk to my wife. Uh, actually, I got my wife uh, asleep. We, we got home at around 9, 10. I got my wife asleep. So I was, I was trying to wake, up, uh, wake her up. Eh? And tell her by the way, there is this word. She was just like, okay, what is it about? Is it about church? Yes. Uh, what, uh, what, what, how much are we going to give uh, January salary? She was like, okay. And then she went back to sleep. Can we appreciate the wife in absentia? <laughs> you know, you want such wives who, you know, they act like, in obedience as yeah. well. Okay, I, I was expecting some pushback so that they can say now. You, you see, but then <laughs> I had to now act on it. Eh? It was like being confirmed. Eh? Yeah. So what what happened is I I wrote a check to Mavuno 
to give the net salary net salary January. Yeah? Mm. So the check cleared yesterday mm. uh, at around 8.30. We were either having breakfast or we had just started. Eh? Yes. Mm. So I saw a notification, the check has cleared. Mm. Went to my bank account, found I had 36 shillings. Wow. <laughs> okay. Yeah, praise it's, the Lord. It's okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then uh, my wife is also giving fast fruit, but hers is a little bit spread. But then, yeah. okay, I just thought God will provide. Eh? Yeah. Uh, by 10.30, my boss calls me and tells me same uh, day same, same day. day yesterday okay 10:30 okay. a.m. Uh, a.m. Mm. my boss calls me and tells me uh, so there's this opportunity that uh, came up and uh, we've decided to go with you and you've basically been promoted oh uh, come on acceleration <laughs> as in 2 hours later 2 hours <laughs> uh, let me just give some context yes. yeah you, you know, people in the ops of office eh, yeah. have policies and procedures and things to follow. Eh? Yeah. So you don't just get promoted. Yeah. As in, there is... So the role that I get promoted to is a manager role. Wow. Oh, come on. But man. then I'm like an officer, like someone, KYM, uh, there. Eh? Yeah. So I have to go through... Several steps. Uh, several steps to yeah. get there. Eh? Yeah. So basically, I've skipped like six years of experience. Wow. <laughs> What? What? Yes. But, but then, because of salary, they're, they're telling me the title will be assistant manager. But basically, uh, for that for that uh, department, I call the shots. Mm. So I'm okay. Oh come so They on. can call me whatever they want to call me. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and just to continue, eh? uh, my mom calls me. At around 12.30. I think mm. these things were happening two hours. Eh? Two hours. <laughs> she calls me and tells me uh, one of my uncles has lost their dad mm. and we are contributing as a family. Mm. So she'll need me to contribute. I have 36 shillings in my, po <laughs> in my account. I don't know what's going to happen. Mm. But I, I tell her, okay, I'll send you some money. Don't worry. Mm. At night, someone sends me 2,500. Tells wow. me that I connected, to connected them to some opportunity some time back. I can't even remember. I don't even know exactly who it is. Wow. Uh, what? Uh, and uh, I'm like, okay. So, mom, take your... I, I even just sent that money. Oh, come on. So, what? I'm like, God will provide for me and yeah. provide for yes. my family. Yeah. Uh, and he will open up doors yeah. uh, that I have not... I, I don't even have an idea of how, but he will because he has shown me. In one day, he has shown me that he can do it. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Can we celebrate him? Martin is a banker who is a discipleship group leader and soon to be an MC leader. Wow. Can you see what we are talking Hallelujah. about? Eh? Hallelujah. First I am. Let me just, let's, why don't we just lift up our hands and, and, and just appreciate. Lord, we receive this testimony. We say it is from you. We give glory to God. Lord, you're the one who has done it. And we thank you because you've done it. Lord, we thank you because you have a plan and a purpose for this man as you promote him into this position, as he manages this division. We pray that, Father God, now your wisdom will be upon him like it was on Daniel of old. We pray that, Father God, he would stand out from among his peers. We pray that you'd give him divine ideas on how to lead the people that he's in charge of. We pray that everything under his watch will be blessed. And Lord Jesus, even as his pastor has testified that he is a kingdom financier, he's a generous man. I pray that, Lord, you would continue to bless him greatly and that, Lord, he would continue to increase that your work would continue to advance. Bless him, bless his wife. I pray that, Lord, in this season they would see the provision of God. They would see the provision of God and that nothing would lack from their house. And so we just speak blessing and we thank you that, Lord, we are also encouraged by that testimony and we give you all the glory. We bless Martin in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for sharing, Martin. Wow. <laughs> Come on, we can give it one more time for Martin. Whew. Jesus is amazing. You know, Pastor Kilonzi just told me, I have a testimony. I have a, I have a, I'm hearing it the same time as everybody else. I was like, okay, I trust you. Just come up with Martin. Tell us a story. And wow. Somebody say acceleration. acceleration. Yeah, yeah. Six steps in two hours. So, so guys, it's not really, it's God's word. 
When I tell you, believe in the prophets and you shall prosper, that's God's word. It's not my word, it's what he has said. And I think what we're saying is let's align ourselves to God's word. Uh, let's, let's, let's follow him. Um, like, I, like I just feel like we're in God's presence. Sometimes I, you're just like, what do we do, God? This is just, you're here. <laughs> it's like you're just, he's overwhelming. He's doing such things. By the way, we prayed for financial miracles. God is just going to do some incredible things. Even before this week is over, there'll be other financial testimonies, by the way. Uh, so I'm just really, really excited about that. So um, again, just a big shout out to all the guys watching online. Uh, I know that you're, we're so blessed. I mean, I think it's harder to watch online than it is here because you don't get the benefit of just being in this place with the atmosphere, the energy, the people around. And so I just want to commend you for sticking in there, hanging in with us. Uh, I know there are some of you who are listening on headphones uh, to, to, to this at work. Pastor George Ahago, I see you. <laughs> Pastor Clifford, I know there's some of you who this is where you are, but you've just committed that you're going to follow as much as you can. And so we bless God for every single one of you. Those of you having a watch party, God bless. And we, our prayer has been that the Holy Spirit who is here will also, through that, as you're participating, will be with you as well. The same awakening that is here will be in your house and in the place you're watching from as well. And so that's really our belief and our trust. So, so come on, just lean in, and we're excited you're here. So, um... We, we uh, to, to, like I said, yesterday I was trying to teach biblical basis. Today I'm, I'm, in, I'm a bit of, this, this morning, let me say this morning, I'm really in a bit of the, the nuts and bolts. I want to get into, I'm, I'm getting into the practicals. And why? Because I believe everyone here is called to disciple people. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. That's your portion. So I believe that the things I'm teaching today are just things to give you, here are the tools. Whether you're a pastor uh, with that title, whether you're completely new to Mavuno and you've just started joining this conversation, these are tools that will help you. These are tools that are just, they're, they're very simple tools. But when you understand how to use them, they cause you to be dangerous to the kingdom of the enemy. There's nobody you will meet that you, you won't be able to change from an ordinary person into a fearless influencer. Your, your nephews will follow Jesus. When you just have these tools, like your family will, not be, will no longer have the destiny it's had because you have the tools to pull people out of darkness into the kingdom of light. So even the DG stuff we're talking about, why should you have a discipleship group that doesn't have your brother and sister and they live around? You know what I'm talking about? These are things of just invite, invite. It's like a church hungry to grow, a group that's just hungry to grow. And it's just, this is how the early church grew. Everybody that came in contact with them was just swallowed up and became a part of the movement of Jesus in, in their generation. And so I really believe this is how we're going to see the kingdom of God go to places in the world that we've never even imagined. So I want to just talk about discipleship conversations. In this second practical part, I'm going to talk about discipleship conversations. So we've talked about how to grow, how to start a discipleship group, how to grow your discipleship group, how to multiply your discipleship group, how to multiply your missional community. So I've given you very practical steps. Like I said, I'm going to send um, the, the notes for this. All the campus pastors, don't worry, you're going to get my notes. Um, and, and, and you can spread them out with your people, uh, use them to train people. Um, but I want, and, and this is the first time, by the way, I've ever shared this stuff. Um, a lot of this stuff has come from just praying over uh, the conversations I've had, uh, Bishop Doug, some of the things he's written, uh, some of the things Worship Harvest have talked about, some of the things we learned in the, the book, Discipleship Culture, and just talking, asking God, give us a simple way that we can have conversations that are easy for us to understand, that fit into our culture. And so this is really the first time. Even my exec team have not had it. Uh, Pastor Milton has been away, and he came and asked me afterwards, was this an executive meeting that I missed? Uh, even my team hasn't had this. We're all hearing it for the same, at the same time together. Amen. Uh, so, so, so you're on the front line of what God is doing at Mavuno Church, in other words. Like this is a conversation that's never been had before, and you're, you're here to hear it. Uh, so how do, we, how do we have those conversations? Uh, how do you make disciples? What are the things you talk to people about? Uh, when you meet them and now they're coming to your house, apart from family night, are there other conversations? How do you help people grow? That's what I want to talk about. And uh, these are conversations that you can have with your kids, and they'll really, really help them grow. These are conversations you can have with your employees at work that will really, these are tools you can use with your employees at work. These are leadership tools that I'm giving you. And once you understand, they're also spiritual tools that you can use anywhere you go. And so they're very valuable tools. Uh, once you know how to use them, you'll find yourself using them everywhere. They're just very useful and beneficial tools. Let me give you a few quotes first. If you make disciples, you always get the church. But if you make a church, you rarely get disciples. 
This was said by Mike Breen, and I think it's such a powerful thing. If you make disciples, you always get the church. That's what I said. Some of you will become accidental church planters. You never ever wanted to be a pastor. It's just that your children outgrew <laughs> your house, and you found yourself pastoring people. If you make disciples, you will always get the church. But if you make a church, you rarely make disciples. And that's one of the reasons I, we, we, we've changed even how we plant churches. Before, we'd go and start a church and then make this, try to make disciples. It's much harder. And now we're saying we want to plant our churches through making disciples. Um, Jesus didn't call us, another one, Jesus did not call us to build his church. Our job is to make disciples. You know, it's interesting because Jesus said, I, him, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail. He never, don't ever get it confused. We never build the church. That's his job. The one thing he said that he won't do is he said, go and make disciples. So our job is to make disciples. Jesus builds the church. Sometimes we twist that around and we think, let me start the church and pray that Jesus makes disciples. That's miss, you're missing your job description. Uh, Jesus builds the church. We make disciples. Um, disciples are the only thing that Jesus cares about. That is fruitfulness. If you, if you want to be fruitful in life, it's disciples. The thing that will give you, you know, it's, it's interesting because for me, I'm always like, it, it's, it's such an interesting thing when I talk about the verse about people smelling of smoke when they get to heaven. The thing about salvation is it's free. It's, it's not something you earn. All you have to do is just accept it. The difference between somebody who's saved and somebody who isn't has nothing to do with their virtue. It has to do with their confession. So the minute you confess Jesus as Lord, the Bible says, boom, you're saved. Just because you happen to hear someone and you say, Jesus, I ask you into my life, be my Lord. Boom, the Bible says you're saved at that moment. And at that point, heaven is your destination. The minute the Holy Spirit comes into your life because you've asked Jesus into your life and the Holy Spirit representing him comes into your life, you're saved. So there's no question about salvation. You should be assured of the fact that if you die today and you ask Jesus into your life, you will be saved. But with time, I began to discover there are distinctions in heaven. He talks about some people who will sow with straw and with, with wood and materials like those, and others who will sow with silver and with gold. In other words, there is a distinction in reward. Even Jesus talks about the parable of the guy who had ten talents and five, and there are some who just get, there's just reward, <laughs> The faithful servant, you know. And so there will be rewards. There will be a distinction in heaven based on reward. So Paul talks about you are my crown. <laughs> what he's saying is when I get to heaven, I will have a crown. And that crown will have all the stones. You know, it's like my crown is, I'll have, it's like, you know, you ever seen armies, how you can tell how serious a guy is because of all the stuff in his uniform. It's like you stand and you just see a guy who's just like, oh, he's just got boom, boom, boom. He started, Parker, even his shirt has run out, they're putting some on his trousers. <laughs> He's like, that's a serious general. When he stands in the room, everybody just salutes. Um, and, and, and basically, in heaven, I believe there will be crown. There will be stars. And people will... <laughs> we may be, you, might fight, you might be surprised who you salute in heaven. It may not be who you think. It may be <laughs> that very simple cleaner in your compass who used to come early in the morning and their job was intercession. You didn't even know. You thought you were paying them to clean the campus. And they're the ones who are chasing away the demons as you preach. You thought it was your anointing. <laughs> and that woman would just come and clean and was sweeping. And you go to heaven and you realize, oh my God, it's her. And she's not wearing her sal uniform anymore. Now she's wearing her white robes. And you realize, oh my God, this... Heaven will be full of surprises, by the way. And some serious bishop who was full of power and miracles in his ministry. And you might find he's a guy who has the car. Is it like this? Like he's a corporal. <laughs> I mean, he's in heaven. He made it. And he's happy. There's joy in heaven. There's no sadness. But it's interesting. There'll be a distinction that way. And what makes a difference? Jesus only cares about disciples. That's what makes us fruitful. Fruitfulness will come out of the people that we're able to help to become like Jesus. That's what we're here on earth for. Jesus it doesn't really... I mean, uh, things like... The things we as churches worry about, our budgets, our buildings, numbers of people coming into church, those are great things, but they're only tools for making disciples. So you can see a church with 10,000 people and you're so impressed. And they've got signs and miracle service, you're so impressed. Jesus comes there and he says, there are five disciples in this church. Yeah, that's what he cares about. It's like, how many people are becoming like me in this church? 
The rest are a crowd. They come every Sunday and they get fed by the amazing anointing service and they go back home. And those are not disciples. Those are converts. Jesus cares about disciples. So the question we must ask as disciples, because I'm assuming all of you are disciples, how do the lives of those in, our, in my discipleship group resemble the lives I see in Scripture? How do the lives of the people that I'm discipling look like Jesus? How am I helping them become more and more like Jesus every day? Are they living lives of purity? Are they praying with authority? Are they bringing people to Jesus? Are they living by faith? Are those things there? Or are they just living like everybody else? Everybody's panicking, so they're panicking. Everybody's hustling, so they're hustling. Everybody's so caught up worshipping money, so they're caught up worshipping money. Everybody's caught up buying new clothes, and that's all they're thinking about. So they're caught up doing the same things, except the only difference is they come to church on Sunday. Is that, are those my people? I must be asking those questions. If you know how to disciple people well, my goodness, you will make an impact for the kingdom of God. So this is why I'm sharing this with you. Like I say, this tool is life and death for you. Because this is going to be a tool that's going to help you add a few, <laughs> a few medals in your, on, your, on your badge. So, so, so you want to take note of these things because they're they are really helpful tools. They're really helpful tools. So let's talk about Jesus' model of discipleship. Um, Jesus' model of discipleship. Mark chapter 3, verse 13 to 14. It says, Jesus went up on a mountainside and he called to him those he wanted and they came to him. And then verse 14, he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. I made this distinction before. Jesus wanted two things with his disciples. Number one, that they might be with him. Jesus was in the business of creating a spiritual family. These guys were going to share life with him for the next few years. They were going to be in his house. They were going to be, his, he was going to be in their house. He was going to share life with them. He's going to share his lowest moments. He's going to share his happiest moments. He's going to laugh with them. He's going to cry with them. He wanted to create a spiritual family. That's his first thing. But the second thing is that he might send them out to preach. Jesus wanted to create a spiritual army. So it's a family that becomes an army. And Jesus, that's what he wants. As he's raising people, he's like, my goodness, you need family. People need family, by the way. Do you know that? Yeah, we all need family. Look around and you see people who need family. Many people are hurting. They don't have family. And they definitely don't have spiritual family. And God is saying, draw them into the family. And as you become their family, help them understand that they're an army. Help them understand that the devil is helpless when they, when they learn how to pray. Help them begin to understand that God has given them a role that's going to rob hell of all the captives and bring them into heaven. Help them begin to understand their spiritual authority. Create a spiritual family create a spiritual army. And those are, that's, that's basically what we do as disciples. We create a family that's an army. When we bring our younger siblings into our group, when we bring the, our neighbors into our group, we're just creating a family, that's love, and an army, that's mission. We do those things together. And that's, those, those two things, uh, Mike Breen calls them invitation, challenge. Invitation, let's say those words, invitation, challenge. So in every place of discipleship, you're always looking for those two things. I want a place that is full of invitation. Invitation is warmth, it's family, it's visiting, it's caring, it's being there for each other, it's loving one another, that's invitation. Challenge is, hey, let's grow, let's be, let's do all the things that God wants us to do. That's challenge. You want to bring those two things. As disciples, those are the things we use. And so Jesus, he drew his disciples close. He loved them. He walked with them. He shared life with them. I, I love, uh, how many, any of you got to, to watch that series called The Chosen? Yeah? It's, it's so much fun. I mean, season one just, I'd cry sometimes watching it. Like, I never, like, I've never seen Jesus represented as a real person. He's always this stoic guy who's always just floating on water. It has been said, but I say to thee. <laughs> I mean, in The Chosen, Jesus laughs. In fact, he cracks jokes, and you're like, God, you cracked a joke. <laughs> and then you're like, why wouldn't he? He's human, and he loves his people. And families crack jokes, they laugh. And it's like he hung out with his people. I think, I think that series, for me, it humanized Jesus more than anything else. Uh, it just helped me begin to realize, yes, he was one of us, God with us. And so, so there's that sense of just a spiritual family. They laugh, they crack jokes, they do things, they get annoyed at each other. But in the process... He's also holding them accountable. Challenge them to grow. 
rebuking evil in them. Get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> That's not something you say to somebody who you're not very close with. Huh? It's like, get thee behind me, Satan. If I told you that, Pastor James, you'd be like, whoa. You know, but it's like, yeah, Satan's, Satan's actually influencing the words you're speaking right now. Those are not your words. He says some tough things to them. You have little faith. Yeah, why did you doubt? So he creates a highly inviting and at the same time a highly challenging culture for his disciples. If you could just put up that uh, matrix, uh, the cross, the invitation challenge. Um, so basically, and please also put it on the other screens. Yeah, put it on those other two, two screens. Yeah. Um, so, hi, so basically, there's a, this is a, something again by Mike Breen. And he talks about uh, high invitation, low invitation, low challenge, high challenge. So he creates a kind of grid. You've seen these kinds of grids before. And so he says, when you have low challenge and low invitation, you're on that bottom part, you have a boring culture. So if your discipleship group has, there's no love. Like people are just there because they were told by Pastor James to be coming to your group. Nobody invests in family. Nobody cares. Nobody visits. Nobody builds. And then nobody's telling them, guys, we need to reach the poor. We need to go out and do evangelism. We need to pray at 430 Guess what happens in the Christian life? You get bored. Anybody seen bored Christians recently? Yeah, there are a lot of bored, bored, bored Christians out there because low invitation, low challenge. Now you go to the top part there, you've got low challenge and high invitation. That's a group where it's like we love each other, guys. We believe in one another. We will die for each other. We meet every week just to share our war stories and to encourage each other and we want to love each other. But there's never anything that we do. Our job is just to meet and love each other. So you end up with what you call a consumer culture, a consumer, a cozy culture. Your group is just, all they do, all they are good for is to love one another, which is a great thing. But the world isn't changing because of that group. That's a consumer group. Anybody seen any consumer groups at Mavuno? Uh-huh. All right. And then you've got this other side, which is high challenge. So high challenge, but low invitation. So that's the guy where there's no visits. In fact, even food is just fuel <laughs> so that we can have conversations. It's agenda. My goodness, God wants us to go. We need to do this. How come you guys haven't done evangelism? Come on, come on, come on. Saturday, we're going to, to see the poor. And it's all about do, 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 and there's no love. And what you end up with is a stressful culture. Very discouraged people. People, people find excuses not to come. Maybe they feel guilty when they don't come, but they find reasons. It's, almost, it's like it's a stressful place to be. You don't want to create that family culture. But then he talks about high invitation, high challenge. Where it's like, I love you too much to let you fall. I'm going to walk with you. I'm here with you for life. Like we're doing this thing. I love you. Your, your marriage will succeed because you're in my group, man. All our marriages are going to succeed. Uh, this is our culture, guys. And it's like, let's, let's eat, man. Let's have a party. It's so-and-so's birthday. Let's celebrate them. It's like, this is our family. But in the process, it's like, hey, on Saturday, once a month, we're going to serve the poor guys. And guys, we're going to have so much fun doing it because we're a family. We're a family that loves. That's building a family culture that has service in it. And hey, guys, let's celebrate. Who's bringing somebody to the group next week? We're trusting God. Someone's going to come to Christ because of us. So the challenge is there, but it's in the basis of invitation. And when you put those two things together, you get discipleship. You get a group that is growing people who are going to multiply. So, so, so it's, such a, it's such a powerful thing when you keep this uh, little vehicle. Just use it to assess your group. And to say, are we leaning too much into invitation at the expense of, of challenge? Or, are we, or am I becoming a drill sergeant, <laughs> leaning too much into challenge and forgetting invitation? Those two things have to work together. They have to work together. Where do you feel most Mavuno life groups have been? Consumer? There's, a, there's love in the church. There's love in our life groups. So most of them, I think I agree, have been in that space. I would say most of them have been on this side of the, <laughs> the left. Uh, so they've either been boring, and those ones don't last long. But then the ones that su survive have been up there in the consumer culture. And what we're saying is, this is not necessarily ideal. We want to transition our groups. We want to transition our people to the place where we're in discipleship. Some people, when they're in cozy and they hear the challenge, they fear that you're moving them to stress. They feel like you're saying we're giving up on love. Some people, are, I've had people come up and say, Pastor M, we used to be such a stressful culture in the past. We used to just be about numbers. Are you moving us back there? 
Because in their mind, they're afraid of getting back into a stressful space. But that's not what it is, guys. We have to move into discipleship. We have to move to a place where we love and we challenge. And we also have to be, remember, as I'm, being, as I'm leading my people in that way, I'm also being led in that way. So it means that even I, if I'm too complacent in some areas, if I'm too cozy in some areas, my disciples should be calling me out as I'm calling out my disciples. So that's the kind of culture that Jesus, I believe, has with his people. Now, the result of this, of having that left side of the quadrant, is that many of our campuses have been, um, have had a small, they just had a small group of people who serve. Many of our campuses have had like, I would say maybe 15 percent, 10 to 15 percent of people doing all the work, and 85 percent of people sitting in church and showing up for life group when they can. And it's just, it's, so what happens is you end up with burnout, and you end up with a lot of pastors who are just burning out, because the work is heavy for them. It's not shared. They're the ones doing it with their small group of associates, and there's a turnover of those associates because associates are burning out as well, because they're carrying all the load, because we have a consumer culture. So how do we change that and move away from that so that there's more people carrying the load because disciples serve. It's part of what it means to be a disciple. Now, I want to talk about then discipleship conversations. So let's talk about then how do we have those conversations where we learn how to challenge people. We learn how to assess people. We learn how to see where this person is spiritually. We learn to see people with spiritual eyes. So this is what I'm going to teach you now. Uh, discipleship conversations. How do you help people apply the truths of God's word? How do you help them understand the things that are going on at family night and even up see how to apply it in their lives? Uh, many people automatically ask, what's our curriculum? What, what study can you give us, Pastor M, that we can lead? Because that's, that's how we know to lead people. If they do Mizizi, we want to keep, what's the next version of Mizizi? By the way, a lot of churches that have done Mizizi, even in the West, that's what they ask me. What's the next? Because it's like d curriculum, had so much impact, they've come to believe that it's a curriculum that disciples people. But curriculums are tools. They don't disciple people. It's people who disciple people. So, so we don't, it's not a curriculum we're going to look for. We want to look for tools, tools that will help us engage people, tools that will help us pe and help our people engage their community. Uh, and, and you know, most of your time in discipleship, it's not going to be based on a study. It's going to be based on spiritual conversations. So I want to give you tools for spiritual conversations. Amen. Anybody ready for some spiritual conversations? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, I'm going to teach you how to speak like Jesus. You know, Jesus would have conversations with people and he'd be like, all of a sudden you realize, oh my God, this is actually a spiritual conversation. I thought we were just talking about how my brother can divide insurance for us. Uh, his inheritance for us and he's refusing to, with my part. And it's like, oh, okay, Sawa, there's something heavenly happening here. Much bigger than I thought. So here's how you do it. I'm going to teach you four tools. And the first tool is called the Kairos moment. Um, the Kairos moment. Um, it's represented by a semicircle, a learning circle. So this is actually a tool that I learned from Mike Breen. Uh, this is a tool to discern what God is doing in people's lives so that you can partner with God. You need to be able to understand that the best way to ever be in the center of God's will is to find out what God is doing and join Him in it. So many times I hear people saying, God, show me your will. God, help me understand your will. Well, it's better to ask, God, open my eyes so I can see you, so I can join you. Because if I already know what you're doing and I join you in it, I'm, I'm, I'm in your will. <laughs> so if I already see what God is doing in Pastor James's life, my job is not to create an agenda. My job is to join God in what he's already doing. So how do you discern what God is doing in someone's life? Again, remember for parents, this is useful for you and your kids. Uh, how do you discern what God is already doing that you join them in it in a conversation? So the way the learning circle works is, uh, so, so there's a verse, John 5, 17, and it says, but Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now, and I have been working. God is always at work. God is always at work. When you meet somebody, assume God is working in their life. God's always at work. So, so Jesus is saying, like, because God is at work, even me, I'm at work. So when I, meet, when I meet Pastor Godwin, I'm assuming God's at work in this guy's life already. So when I'm working, I'm joining God in what God is already doing. By the way, when, you, when, you, when you're praying for healing, that's going to be what we do. Is because you start to understand what is God already saying, so I just affirm what God is saying. That's, that's really what healing is. I'm just affirming what God... If I know God's word, I'm, it, that's the beauty of knowing God's word, by the way. Because I'm able to understand, this, God has said it, I'm just affirming it. It's not my word, it's God's word. And God is a man of his word. 
If he said it, it's going to happen. So, so how do we get what God is saying? God is always at work. So as you listen to people sharing, listen with spiritual alertness. Always be very keen asking yourself and asking the Holy Spirit because you spend time in the morning asking God to fill you with his Holy Spirit. That's one of the reasons you're asking God to fill you. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of discernment. So ask God, help me. Pray a quick prayer. You can even pray it silently. Lord, give me a word. Show me what you're doing in this person's life. Help me to listen carefully. Always listen to what they're saying, but listen to what God is doing in what they're saying. And Kairos moments are those moments when God breaks into our reality and time. You're having a normal conversation. You're having a normal thing. And then all of a sudden you just realize, oh my goodness, I'm in the presence of God. Uh, Jacob had a Kairos moment. He was asleep. He thought he was having a dream. And all of a sudden he realized this is actually a portal. I'm in an, I'm in an altar here. I'm in God's house. Uh, it became called Bethel. But it was Bethel before he, he got there. It's just that as he's sleeping, he realized there's actually a portal to another dimension right here. And what I saw was not just a dream. There's something, this heaven comes much closer to earth in this place. Um, so what hap- how do you have those heaven has just come closer to earth conversations with people? The question you must constantly learn to ask in every discipleship group meeting. When you're talking about what, we lo- what you learned in family night, the questions you're always asking people is, what is God saying to you? And what are you going to do about it? Two very simple questions. I don't, it's not, after I've shared, maybe as a discipleship group leader, I've heard what Pastor M said, I've given my summary. Because remember, we talked, we talked about passing impartation. Huh? It's like, here's what I've received from Pastor M, guys. Uh, I really hear what he's saying is this. Just summarize it in your own words. And then say, guys, what, are you here? what did you hear? And what are you going to do about it? What did God say to you? What are you going to do about it? And what happens is when a person is responding, listen to whether the, what the Holy Spirit is doing. Because sometimes there's something deeper going on. And sometimes the way I sense what the Holy Spirit is doing is through emotions. Like sometimes somebody is speaking and you just feel like an, there's an emotion that's come up. Sometimes it's a positive emotion, sometimes it's a negative emotion. Sometimes they'll speak and you'll see a tear. Sometimes you just feel anger or you feel energy in the way they said something. And you're like, there's something going on. Sometimes they'll, they'll, you, you just see like they're, they're like confused by what, what is going on. You're watching. Remember, you're always watching carefully with with spiritual eyes to see what God is doing. As you observe them, you're able to see that there's something deeper going on. And when you see it, uh, when you see that something, when they sound angry or they sound confused, at that point, you understand there's a Kairos moment. Perhaps there's a Kairos moment. You're discerning. There could be something going on behind what Osai just said. Um, Why did she respond so fast, so angrily? What made her just shut down that conversation? What made her just say, I really don't have anything to say about this topic? (laughs) Because sometimes somebody says that and you move on. But you should be asking, is there something going on that I don't know? So you need to learn to ask the question. So basically, if you put up the Kairos circle again, um, what's happening is you're having a conversation. And the conversation is the guy walking on that path. We're just walking in the group. And somebody says something. At that point, as a leader, I have a choice. I can either keep walking, let's just keep talking, let's ignore what happened, that embarrassing moment, that awkward moment, that thought, or I could say, no, 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 let's stop and change direction. Change direction. This, this circle has two things. It has repent and believe. Repent is change direction. Maybe this is an opportunity for this person to repent because they've been walking the wrong way. And by the right question, I can help them begin to understand that. So they can repent, because repent is change direction, and then believe. Believe is own God's direction. So by the time we're getting up again and they're moving on, they're not the same person. There's a process we've gone through in that circle that has shifted their reality or their perception of reality. So as a, what, what you need to understand is this, 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 these words. So number one, observe. They were speaking, and I had something. I just caught something. They said something in passing, and I was like, Maybe we're talking about honoring fathers. And they said, I don't know, some men are just not worth honoring. And then they caught themselves and they said, you know, God tells us to honor and praise God. So you're like, uh-uh. Osai, you said something. Sorry, you're my daughter. I can use you on this one. You just said something and I caught, I caught something there. It's like, like, and by that time, because I'm praying, I'm like, okay, God, I pray that you will allow her to see something here. And I ask, I just caught something. You just said men are not worth honoring. What's that? What made you say that? Like, I just sensed there was something deeper when you said that. I'm giving you an opportunity to discuss it. 
let's have a conversation. And hopefully then, because I didn't ignore it, you're able to say, you guys don't know me, man. You don't even know my story. You have no clue the kind of father I had. Boom. There's a Kairos moment right there. It's like God was doing something and I almost missed it. And because now we can discuss it, I can say, tell us about your father. Let's, let's talk a bit about this. Tell us about that because maybe there's somebody here who will be helped by that story. And she opens up and it's like, guys, this is what happened to me when I was two. And this happened. And how, how are you supposed to honor someone like that? And maybe in that process, tears start to come. Hey, hey, don't run away from those tears. It's like, hey, maybe, maybe we don't have to finish questions for everybody today. This is what the group needed to do. You understand? We're not going through an agenda where everybody has to speak. Sometimes that Kairos moment is for all of us. And it's like, guys, I think we just need to pause for a second and let's just talk about this. Let me get a couple of the ladies. Just go sit next to her. Let's finish this story. And we hear the story. And guess what's happening? As she's talking, I'm asking more questions. Do you feel that that caused you to lose trust in God? And she's like, yeah, you know? And at that point, then we, we have a... There's a place for me now to be able to say, okay, what do you think God is saying in this? Because now that the, the space is open, she's a Christian. She'll hear God. I'm not telling her what God is saying. I'm saying, now you've heard what Pastor M said about God. What do you feel? How do you feel that what God is saying could apply in what you're doing? And as she's answering, there's a chance for a plan to start coming out. And I thought where she starts to say, maybe I, I need to start honoring this person, even though he's no longer there, my, I need to change how I think about fathers. I need to do this. I need to do this. And then you're able to say, okay, I love that. I love that God is doing that. Hey, let's do this. What, what's one thing you could do on this one that we can ask you next week? That's accountability. What's one thing that we can pray? And maybe your prayer partner can actually be praying with you this week. And the person says, okay, this week I'm going to call my uncle. He's the father of God left. And I'm just going to tell him the story. And I'm going to tell him, I forgive you on behalf of my dad, and I want to honor you as my dad right now. Awesome. Hey, can we just pray right now? You know, it's just like we've just had a spiritual conversation. Huh? And that conversation has changed everything in that group. It's like God was in the house, but we almost missed it. I almost said next. <laughs> but because I was discerning, I was listening, I was like, you sounded confused. There's something you said just now that I caught. What was going on? You caught a Kairos moment. Is that, does, that, does, does, that make, does that sound like something you can do? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's be discerning as a leader. Don't be in such a hurry. Sometimes what happens when people are coming to my house, I'm so busy, I'm setting the table, I'm the one carrying juice. When people are talking, I'm like, okay, just keep talking, just keep talking, let me just get... You will miss everything. So clear the space so that if you're hosting, if they're coming to your house, you have, you have space to look into people's eyes and to open your, your spiritual ears. That's how a Kairos moment works. And you know, it says act because act is the last thing. It's like now you're, we're holding you accountable. Next week, I want to hear a testimony as we are starting of how this went. Now there's action. So James chapter 1 verse 22 says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. That's the whole idea of being a Christian is to do what God has told you. So, so that, <laughs> questions, they facilitate reflection. When you understand Kairos moments, you become a listener. By the way, the best prophets, they listen. Sometimes as you're praying, you just see something happening and immediately tells you, Lord, there's something in this sister that I need to just lean, I need to watch her a bit closely because there's something that this word is making her uncomfortable. They don't just close their eyes and look to the heavens. <laughs> They're also discerning what's happening in the people. So this is just a, a, a very prophetic tool that you can use, even at work, as you're having a meeting. These are the deliverables, guys. These are, and somebody just reacts in a certain way and you can be like, okay, I caught something there. Let's talk about that. And it'll help you just be a much better leader. Amen. How many people are feeling much better equipped to lead a group right now? Yeah, that, by the, that, the Kairos moment is one of the most important tools you'll ever know as a Christian leader. It's just such a great way to listen. You start to do that and you just find people opening up to you. You find yourself helping people solve their own problems just by asking the right questions and listening keenly to what they're saying. So that's number one. Okay, could you, could you do, a, do me a favor with this one? Just take a moment and discuss with, a na with your neighbors, if you're two or three, just what, what you've heard and what you like about that tool. I just want to make this one really practical. Um, what, what, what you've heard about, what you've learned in that moment, and what you think of, what, what is one thing you really like about it or one thing that you're uncomfortable about? Yeah.
Make sure the other person also gets to share. Put up the slide again, the circle. Media team. Yeah, thank you. Just leave it up for a sec. Again, I'm going to share, I'm going to share these tools with you, so don't, 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 uh, we'll send you all the information. Awesome. Okay, that's tool number one of four. And uh, like I said, probably the most powerful one I know, even though the rest are also quite something. Okay. I love the conversations I'm seeing. I'm just going to move on to the next two. Um, but let's keep the conversations going because I think you're going to find that these tools are going to be very useful for you as leaders. So the next tool, this, the next tool is called, is the, it's a triangle. The first one was that circle. The next one is a triangle and it's balanced relationships. Balanced relationships. Now, the triangle is a tool to measure the relational health of an individual or a group. So you want to see, check the relationships, the relational health. How is our group doing relationally? How are you doing relationally? How are your key relationships in life doing? So that's what this tool uh, does. So this is about learning to dive deeper into relationships. God made us relational beings. Salvation happens relationally. Sanctification, we're getting closer to God. It happens with other people. And so how healthy are your relationships? That's what you're checking with your people. And this one is a good one because sometimes you want to sit, you're sitting with somebody and you're having a conversation and you want to, maybe you're having that personal conversation and you're thinking, how do I assess how well you're doing in your, so I can speak into the relationships? What are the areas where you're not doing as well but I can help you in? Or you've got a discipleship group and you want to figure out how well is our group doing uh, in their relationships? So this uh, triangle has three parts. It has the up. And up is relation. All of us have these three relationships. Up is your relationship with God. Your relationship with God. Luke chapter 6 verse 12 says, One of those days Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spend the night praying to God. Oh, do you ever marvel at that? God, praying to God. <laughs> it's like he's bonding. It's like I've missed, the, I've missed the rest of the Trinity, man. A whole night. As guys are snoozing, he's just hanging out. Hanging out. It's like, I think he's modeling to us the kind of intimacy God wants for us. It's like, man, he leaves his disciples after a day of ministry. It's like, you guys go sleep. I've got things to do. And he's just out there. Like, wouldn't you have wished to be a fly on the wall? Like, wouldn't you want to hear Jesus? Like, how was he praying? Like, what was he doing the whole night? Was he walking around speaking in tongues? Or was he just like, the Trinity appeared to him and they're just having, uh, did they, okay, let me not go too far. Because I'm thinking of what I do with my boys when I hang out the whole night. But I don't know what he was doing. And it's like, I would have loved to be a fly on the wall. But he loved the intimacy, the conversation. And the, the thing about the app is I'm checking out your relationship and I'm saying, how's your relationship with God doing right now? And there, what I'm asking for is, how's your worship? Prayer, Bible reading, church attendance, spiritual growth, tithing. All these are indicators to me of your love for God. If you're in a place where I haven't been to church for two years, there's something I need to ask about that. If you're in a place where, like, my, my goodness, yeah, my prayer life, I'm not doing so well right now. I haven't read the Bible in a long time. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're saying you love God. Those are indicators to me. It's like saying I love my wife and we haven't talked for two years. I mean, seriously, I'll be like, okay, I hear your words and I respect your words, but there's a problem. <laughs> you, can't, you can't be saying you're, you're happily married and you haven't talked for that long. Um, yeah, your, your tithing. Tithing, by the way, is something that we use with Pastor Caro to assess people. The time somebody comes and tells us, oh, pray for me, I've got issues. And one of the, she taught me to ask this question. She asked that question, by the way, are, are you tithing? Do you tithe? And she's like, you know, there's one demon that only God can exercise for you. The demon of the divara. Even if I pray, how it won't come out of your life. So sometimes she tells somebody, go and tithe and then come back, I pray for you. Even if you're not from Avuno, go tithe in your church. And then come back and I'll pray for you. It's a powerful lesson there. Because it's like, if you have invited Devara into your life, it means you're not growing. 
So having real conversations. And by the way, as a discipleship group leader, that question, that conversation is not out of your purview. It's actually part of your responsibility to ensure I can speak for my disciples. There are tithers. All of them tithe. Yeah, I need to know that. And I need to be happy about that because I'm like, they are doing right in their relationship with God. So that's the first relationship. The second one is relationship with other Christians. And again, you find... Um, this is the next verse after the one of Jesus praying the whole night. It talks about when morning came. This is now. He's been, <laughs> he's been hanging the whole night with God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and he chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. Maybe they were going through short lists with, <laughs> in heaven. HR department was there. And it's like, okay, this one, uh, no, no, no. He's, he's, he's called only five points on this. Okay. And it's like, they're having, and it's like the 12. So the next morning came, he called his disciples to him. He chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. And verse 14, um, sometime, yeah. Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, and then verse 15, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Lord. By the way, none of these guys was just a figure. It was, there were names. There's a reason why they're names. Names are important to Jesus. He knew their names. The people that God assigns to you are God who is assigned. He knows their names. He wants you to be familiar with them. He wants you to love those people. They are not just statistics. They are people. They are destinies. So, so the, question with, the question we're asking in terms of relationship with other Christians is Jesus is calling people to be a spiritual family. And what you're asking people is how are your relationships with your spiritual family? How are you connected with other believers? Um, and what you're looking for there is you're looking for the discipleship group participation. Like when was the last time you attended your discipleship group? Uh, family night. Like, do you watch Family Night? Um, if, if, if this is your family, there's a problem if you're not. Uh, do you, I mean, are you serving? By the way, it's not like you're sitting down in the checklist. Are you serving? Are you in it? Huh? <laughs> but it might be a thing where I say, by the way, I haven't seen you at, pre, at, at, at a discipleship group for the last couple of weeks. What's going on? Because me, that's a symptom that there's a fracture in your family, that something is cutting you out of fellowship, and fellowship is critical for your faith for you to grow. Uh, showing up for others, accountability. Uh, you said you do something, you haven't done it. So I'm looking at those things to say, how are you in the fellowship? How are you relating in fellowship with fellow believers? And the best place for that accountability is discipleship group. Pastor James can't tell when people don't come to church for, for, for two weeks, unless they're the people who greet him every Sunday. The church is too big, but you can tell because you're the discipleship group leader. You can actually say, by the way, we haven't seen you at church for the last couple of weeks and you haven't told me you traveled. What's up? Why? Because that's affecting your in. There's an in somewhere that is missing. So that's a place you assess. And again, if it's for the group, then you're saying, how are we doing as a group? Are we worshiping together for our up? Are we loving each other? Are we doing enough things to just express love to one another? Um, that's how you assess your group as well as a group leader. And then now the third one is out. And out is relationship with lost people, uh, because God loves lost people. Uh, the next verse after that, uh, it says, after he's called his people, it says, he went with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured. And then verse 19, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. So guess what happens? Jesus gets his guys. He's called them by name. He loves them. And he's like, guys, come with me. Let's do some missions. Let's preach the gospel. Let's heal the things that we're taught. Teach about the kingdom. Bring healing. So what is this talking about? Out really has to do with relationships that assess my, uh, assessing my love for lost people. We can easily become so caught up in our church relationships in our small group that we really have no time for people who are not saved. We have no time for people who are lost like we were lost. We become those survivors on the island who are so happy to have survived the wreck, they don't care about the people who are still drowning out there. They just build a camp for themselves and they're dry now and they're happy and they're living on coconuts. And they have no time to swim out and help the other people who crashed in the same ship. So we become those people who are rescuers. That's what the out is looking for. So out, we're looking at your love for unbelievers. Man, it's been a long time since I saw you invite someone to church or even bring someone to, to, to life group. What's happening? Uh, to discipleship group. What's happening? Uh, sharing the gospel. 
we've, you've not come with us for evangelism for a long time. I, I, is, is there something? Is there a problem? Uh, treating the powerless. When we go to serve, I, I notice you never come when we go that month. What's happening? Or, by the way, you can also use it as an affirming tool. It's not just a troubleshooting tool. You can also say, I really am impressed at how you show up for lost people. I'm really impressed at how you, you seem to do this. And many times I'll start with the area somebody's doing really well. And then I'll be like, I've noticed, I don't see you showing up here. What's happening? Um, serving the poor and serving the needy in our front line. Now, sometimes I'll even give somebody or the group the tool to use themselves. And I'll say, hey, guys, here's a triangle. Write it up. Here, explain it. And then I'll say something like I'm about to say to you right now. Draw the triangle for yourself. And then for each of those, give yourself a mark out of 10. So up, 10 is like, my gosh, like, um, like I don't even sleep. I just speak in tongues in bed. Even in my dreams, I'm just in heaven, you know? I'm like so close to God. God and I are just like this right now. It's so awesome. And then uh, a one would be like, my goodness, I don't remember the last time I felt anything for God. It's like my relationship with God has just been in such trouble. Uh, try and avoid five because five, is, five usually means you don't want to make a decision. So at least if it's, if it's, it's in the middle somewhere, make it a four or a six, okay? So give yourself that. And then for lost people, uh, I'm sorry, for the in, how are your relationships with your discipleship group or with other, Christi other Christians? Is it like we're rocking? I love my group. I love my ministry. I love the people I'm serving with. Or is it like, man, that was a long time ago. I'm a retired Christian. <laughs> like I come to church, but it's like the young people serve because I've done my time. Uh, and then out would be, relationship with lost people. My goodness, I'm so passionate. In fact, I've been having conversations with my neighbors and I'm so excited that they're coming to my DG right now. I'm, I'm, man, I'm even doing like every week, I'm going out to the college next door, I'm sharing the gospel. And then a one would be like, man, the last time I had a relationship with somebody who's not saved for the sake of the gospel, like was a long time ago. So come on, I hope you're doing the assessment right now. Huh? Yeah. Right, write a number, write a number. I want you to commit. I like Pastor Timo, you're an A student. You've already done your work. <laughs> As I was speaking, you had finished the, the assignment. Do you, hit a stu do, you, do you have students like those in your class? It's like the teacher has, by the time you ask the question, they've already given the answer, and it's like, okay, done. The exam has just started, and the guy has stopped writing. He's like, when are you guys finishing? All right. So um, anybody who scored on your app, Somewhere between 7 and 10. Let me just see. Show of hands. Like, like you're like, praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. How many people scored between 7 and 10 in your in? Like, I'm really, really loving my relationships. I'm connected to the community. Awesome. How many scored 7 to 10 on your out? Like, we're reaching out. I'm loving the relationships I have with non-believers. So effectively reaching out. Okay. If you assess this group, you can really tell where the problem is. <laughs> I love the fact that there's a lot of us who are loving our relationship with God right now. And by the way, I'm so excited about that. I really believe it's part of what God is doing in this season. And I love the fact that the community is beginning to gel. But I think only two hands went up for love for the lost. And so already I can tell if I was your DG leader, I'd be like, okay, clearly, I need to put a bit of energy into that area. I need to affirm these first two areas and just be like, guys, I'm excited. Let's keep growing. But then I also need to say, okay, we can't have the size, a group this size and we're not doing as well. So are you seeing how I use that to assess? And that means I'm going to put a lot more energy in making sure my group is out doing the outreach, doing the evangelism, because it's like one of those things. If I have to have personal conversations, I'm going to do it, because it's telling me this is where my group is suffering. If I'm meeting an individual, I can already tell where I need to disciple them. It's like, okay, by the way, uh, I noticed this one's really hard for you. Let me invite you. I'm actually going out on Wednesday to share the gospel. Can you come with me? Uh, I'd love to just have you come with me. It's not that I'm perfect, but it's like, okay, you're doing as badly as me. We have to go, <laughs> you know? So it, it gives you a tool that you can say, let's, let's go and do this. Uh, our church is doing an outreach. Let's go and do it. So it's like this tool helps me begin to understand what I need to call you into. Or, or can you join me at 4.30? Because I can see you're struggling in this area. Join, join us at 4.30 because, man, this is where I've been trying to wake you up. Uh, I really think if you wake up, something's going to change in your life. And so it's, it's using this tool to, to assess the relationships in your group. C can you see how this tool is not hard to use? Again, it's not like you have to use it every time, 
I'm just giving you the tools. It's like you have, you have, you have, you have if, you're, if you've ever seen those guys in the movies who are, okay, I watch action movies, they always have tools for certain jobs. So a guy has, he has these ones, then he has like a small one for in his coat, and then he has the one under his boot. Okay, you can tell I watch too many movies. <laughs> but all of those guns have a different purpose. They blow up different things. So if you have the different tools and you know this one is for here, this one I've learned to use it for here. And guess, by the way, the more you use them, the better you become at using them. So you're going to find that you actually become better as you go. All right, let's go to um, the third tool. Um, and this one is about life rhythms. It's about the semicircle. So the first one was a full circle. This one is a semicircle. And it's about life rhythms. This is a tool to ensure that you and your group members are living life by the rhythms of grace. Now, Jesus in Matthew 11, verse 28, he says some very powerful words. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And then he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And then finally he says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, it's very interesting because God created us to be human beings, but the world wants to force us to be human doings. It's trying to convert us. Uh, the world seeks to impose its rhythms on us. Uh, it either causes us to want to work, 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 and not take any break. Uh, until we burn out, we become frantic, we become used up. Or it causes us not to see the, 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 the value of meaningful work and to hate work, to become complacent about work, to even become lazy about work. Those are the extremes that the world will find us, will push us into. We forget that God created work and assigned it to humans. You know, some people think that work came when humans sinned and God punished them. <coughs> Go and work. But actually, work was in the Garden of Eden. What happened is because of our sin, work was corrupted. So, so it's because of sin that we end up either hating work or worshipping work. Some of us worship work. It's just the way the light that we've been pushed into. We don't even realize that's what it is. It's like we, we, we don't work so that we can be, we're not, we're not on assignment at work. That work has defined us. Our jobs have defined us. Our positions at work have defined us. It's, we are, it becomes our identity. I am a manager. I am, I am this. And that's what defines me. If I lost that, I'd lose my identity. I'll do everything I can to keep that position because I don't understand why I'm there in the first place. And that's worshipping of work. Uh, that, that, that's the worship of work. Somebody like that will not ever think about compromising when it comes to their work. A promotion comes and you just take it automatically. You don't ask, is this going to take me away from my family? Is this going to take me away from my, my church? Is this going to take me away? Uh-uh. It's like, it's more money, it's better position, it must be from God. That's called worship of work. Do you know people who are like that? I'm hearing some very muted yeses. <laughs> that's, that's the way our culture has shaped us to be. That's why you go to an interview and they ask you, so what's your weakness? And you say, I just tend to work too hard. <laughs> you even know they'll give you the job when you say that. I mean, it's like, it's like we're just, it's messed up. That's not how God wants it to be. And so you find, I mean, I remember one of my friends who that was his, he was like that. He was so messed up. Like, he had been a Christian, he loved God, but he hadn't been to church for a long time because his bank job just insisted. He had to work all the time. He would leave work at nine because you never left before the manager. And the guy, the guy would look at you badly if you left before. They were just a mess. And I remember we used to, we challenged him as his friends and say, this is not right. You're going to lose your marriage. You're going to lose your children. It is not right for you to, ain't to gain the whole world and lose your soul. And as a Christian, I think it took him a year. Some people just take a long time to lose that security because they're so defined by work. And finally, he went and resigned. And he just told guys, I'm out. He didn't even have a job. I think he finally got to the place where he was pushed against the wall and he was like, finished. I think they had an argument with his wife or something happened. And he's like, it's true, I'm losing my marriage. He went and just went home, stayed for a couple of weeks. And then a competitor hired him. And when they called him, I mean, he was actually headhunted. And they called him, they asked him, why did you resign? He shared. And then they, uh, they told him, we want you to work for us. He said, well, you know me now. I have conditions. Uh, I, leave, I leave the office latest six. I'd like to be leaving at five and later six. And I, I need to be able to have time for my family so I don't work on Sundays ever. And even Saturdays I'll work when I have to and if I can work from home even better. And they told him, 
anything else? And the guy said, well, I wouldn't mind a little more money. They said, done. They gave him a job. And you know, all this time, he hadn't trusted God to. He just kept feeling, if I leave my job, I'm dead. He didn't understand the provision was the Lord. God is the one who gives you the ability to create wealth. That's part of his covenant. The job is not what provides for you. Some of us are so tied to our job and so fearful. So guess what happens? His MD, former MD, he has, he's been hired by the computer. He was mad. He called him. He said, how dare you work for those guys? And the guy said, you know I resigned. I just couldn't hack those hours. The guy told him, okay, what, do you, what are they giving you? What do you need? I leave at this time. I do this. I do this. He said, okay, how much are they paying you? He said, he said, if I double that and I give you those terms, can you come back? So he said, yeah. <laughs> so he went back to the same bank. He was being paid double. He now had, every, he would leave everybody else in the office and go home because he was on special terms. And yet he had not trusted the Lord for a couple of years of pain. Am I talking to somebody in the house? That is called worship of work, not understanding who put you in that job. I mean, look at my friend Henry who says, I gave my fast fruits and I got a promotion. It's not your boss who promoted you. The promotions come from heaven. He's who? He, and he's here. By the way, he's being promoted when he's seeking God's kingdom. Eh? There are people in the office who are waiting for that promotion like this. And the guy came to church for four days and he's being called. By the way, we have decided to skip you four, six, four steps. Or how many steps were those? Six steps. There's a kingdom economy, you understand? And when we get caught up in this way, then you find your team members will never grow. They will never have time for their families. They will never have time for ministry. And they will never be fruitful. As a disciple, you can't allow that. Then you have other people on this other side who hate work. They hate their jobs. They hate work. And so what has happened? They've become complacent about work or they've become lazy. And it's this husband who maybe lost his job and doesn't even want to look for a job. He just wants to sit in the house. Or this wife who's just con content to be there. And you're saying, no, 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 you are created for more. You are created for more than sitting on the couch. There's meaningful work. It's part of your makeup. So 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8 on this side says, anyone who does not provide for their relatives, and especially for their own household, is worse than an unbeliever. It says that. So don't become lazy. Don't become lazy. But on this other side, when people are worshipping their jobs, Deuteronomy 8, 18, it says, remember the Lord your God, for it is He... Who gives you what? Ability. He gives you the ability to produce wealth and confirms his covenant. So understand that it's both things. You, need, you, you, can't, you can't be on this extreme and you can't be on this extreme. And so let's go back to that pendulum because it's such an important one, uh, the semicircle. Um, it talks about the fact that um, there's, it's like a pendulum. It's like a, it's like a little pendulum that swings. And our lives have to have those two things. God created the world. In seven days, uh, he worked for six days. So there's work. You have to move towards work because that's where fruitfulness will come. You cannot be fruitful unless you put in effort. But then the pendulum has to swing the other side, which is rest. And on the seventh day, God rested. Now, that day he called it the Sabbath. He called it the Sabbath and he rested. And so the interesting thing is as human beings, we're supposed to abide, <laughs> to, 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 to rest, and then to be fruitful. To work and I need to be watching my people in my group to be able to say how are you doing because one of the big curses of our generation today is burning out couples who don't even have time for their marriage and you'll have them in your discipleship group people who don't even have time for their children you'll have them in your discipleship group because I'm so caught up believing my job provides for me that I can't rest and then you'll have other people who are on the other extreme so this little tool what it does is that it helps you to be able to assess. Let me say this. Nations that have no God, they don't have this pendulum. Nations that come from cult cultures that have no God have no pendulum like this. Uh, when these buildings were being built around us, uh, the contractors here were Chinese. And their nation is, for a long time, was an atheist nation. I think in some ways it still is. And let me tell you, those guys worked seven days a week, 24 hours a day. They would just have shifts. It's human doings. And if you don't come for the seventh day, you're, they, they'll kick you out and get somebody who's willing to work. So you use people and you spit them out. You use people and spit them out. You go to Japan and people are just, you work like a dog. The, 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 the culture esteems you just working, working until you die. And it's like, God did not create that. 
In the cultures where people knew Jehovah, there is rest. I went to Germany once, and Germany has become a very secular country today. But because it's anchored in its Christian roots, I remember being in a town, a large town, looking for a shop that was open on a Sunday. Like, better even Nairobi. Like, nothing was open. Like, all shops were closed. And it's because that pendulum, they, it was just ingrained in their culture. You rest, then you work. And because of that, a lot of Europeans have a very healthy work culture. Because of the gospel, by the way. Even the Americans lost it a long time ago because the Americans, they just use people. But the Europeans, if you go, you'll find they rest and then they work. Work comes out of rest. So what am I, why do I like this tool so much? It's able to tell me, it's, it's a diagnostic tool. When I see people stressed, I'm able to sit with them and say, on this pendulum, where are you? Are you constantly stressed, constantly burning out? Are you at the place where you're, you're, so, you're so stretched that, you, that you're always uh, anxious? Or are you at the place where you're bored and there's no challenge in your work? And maybe you're even just not even feeling that job anymore. It's a pendulum. And for me, what I'm able to tell people is God did not intend that for you. And at times I've told people, you need to just actually start looking for another job right now because that's not the job for you. That's not your calling. God did not intend you to be in a place where you're so stressed you cannot look after your, your, your family. So that's another tool, and it's about assessing the, the rhythm of rest for your people. Is that another tool you can use? So I'm just giving you tools for spiritual conversation. Jesus told his disciples, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The gospel is about working from rest. Remember I told you about lay, uh, wealth without sorrow. When I learned that lesson, by the way, there are deals I've refused to take. People will give me a deal that will make me a lot of money, and I'll be like, this one will take me away from my family. I'm not doing it. Pastor Caro and I made a commitment to each other many years back. And I used to travel. My job in insisted that I travel a lot. And we made a commitment that the longest I'll ever be away from my wife is three weeks. And when, it's three, when, I, when, I, miss, when I go away for three weeks, I feel like my world is ended. Like, I, like it's hard. Like it's painful for me. Because I made that commitment. We made that commitment as a young couple. It's part of our rhythm. We're just like, we'd, like, we're not going to destroy our marriage for any contract, any business, any job. I don't care what that job is. I'd rather we are poor and we have each other than we are rich and we are divorced. Um, so when people come and tell me I've gotten a promotion, it means I'll be living in another country. And I'm not judging, by the way, but this happens a lot. And it means I'll be in Qatar and I'll be coming home every month for two days. God's people, my answer to you, don't even tell me. Now I can tell you what Pastor M will tell you. It's not God's will. That job is not God's will for you. I know. You're looking at me in shock. This pastor wants us to stay poor. Remember, it is not that, that job that will provide for you. Yeah. And what does it profit you to gain the whole world and lose your marriage? Who are you gonna, have you ever seen lonely, rich people with no purpose? That's how you're heading. That's where you're going to. So I tell people, no, that's not, that's not God's plan for you. Don't enter into that space. Uh, God's plan for you is that you're together. I went to a church once, Car Pastor Karen and I went to a church once, and we did a marriage enrichment. And I, I made that comment, and the room was very quiet, very quiet. And then later we discovered in that town, and in that church particularly, everybody does that. Everybody, including the pastor themselves. Wife worked in another town, husband worked in another town. They saw each other for weekends. The whole church was a pen pole church. I mean, it's like, okay, some of you don't remember pen poles. It's like the <laughs> long distance relationship church. But the state of the marriages was horrible. Carol sat down with some of the women and it's just pain, 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 pain. These guys can't serve God. They can't. Their marriages are just in too much pain. So as a disciple, the first question I'm asking is, why would you allow that to happen to you? Do you think you'll be effective for the kingdom? Do you think you'll ever be fruitful? And, next, and then do you think you'll ever be able to bring up children who are healthy? You're passing this one to the next generation. I wish I could tell you which town it was because some of you are from that town. It's, it was a sad state for us. So, so guys, this is a tool that you'll use to help assess the, the, the... And even single people, by the way. I know people in this church who are so stretched by their work that they, don't, they can't even come to church on Sunday. Because it's like you're so pushed and you're so stretched that you're so exhausted. And by, by, man, by Sunday, it's just like you're just shaking. And by the way, you can even be coming to church and they call you. And what I want to say is, guys, that's not God's will for you to be in that place. 
Start to pray that God gives you another job. Start to look for another job. And start to trust God. Sometimes God might even tell you, get out of that job and I'll provide. Discipleship is not just saying nice things. It's telling guys, guys, if you don't have a good marriage, you'll never serve God well. Yeah? Pastor Carol and I have effectiveness because of our marriage. I love this woman, by the way. Let me tell you, those decisions, those decisions we made when we were young, have, they've made me enjoy. Like, I'm in my 50s and I love being with my wife till now. Like, we can talk the whole day. You guys, we work together. We take an hour from our home to come to Hill City. We talk the whole way in the car. Then we come here where the exec, where she sits next to me in the exec meeting. We talk the whole, then we leave and we go home talking the whole way. And we get home and our kids are like, come on guys, give us space, you're still talking. We love each other, we're friends. But we didn't just become friends, there are decisions we made that have made us enjoy our marriage. And now that we have some, some wealth that God has given us, we're able to enjoy the wealth because we're two of us. Why make, I have so many friends of mine, even Christian friends who are so uncomfortable around their wives because they created patterns of separation when they were young. And what happens is now they're trying to get back together again. And you know you've not been together. You've been living in different cities for so long that when you come to the house, it's fun for the first three days. Then you start to realize friction is starting. I've always been used to my space. Now you, why are you leaving your socks there? And you've ne it's like I've had all these years, I've had control of the space, now you're coming in. And then guess what ends up happening? The guy finds his farm in Kitale and moves there and decides God is calling him in this season of his life to be a farmer. What is happening is he can't stand his wife for more than three days at a time. Those are called patterns of separation. So what we're trying to do here is just become shepherds of people's souls. I'm trying to teach you how to be a shepherd of people's souls. You're able to assess and say, even as a single person, you have no time for friendships. How will you ever get a husband? Yeah, you'll grow old in that job because you're so busy, you can't even be around where people are. How, when you're not coming to church, where are you going to meet a man? What kind of man will you meet if you meet them? Because the man is here. In fact, in this room right now, in Jesus' name, there are some people who are supposed to hook up in this week. Yeah. His name is Nash. Where is Nash? <laughs> He's 27. Ah, sour, sour. We can hear that. Some eligible young lady needs to be talking to Pastor Kelonzi. So, so, so yeah, I mean, you, you could be in the office and yet husbands are being found and wives are finding each other. So, okay, let me share the last. Okay, hold on. Maybe let's process that one because I could see guys were really thinking about that. Just take a moment with your neighbor and say, what did you hear and what made you comfortable or uncomfortable about that conversation? Just be as honest as possible. Okay, let your neighbor share as well before we go to the last two. Okay. So these conversations are actually teaching you how to be a pastor, to pastor God's people, to shepherd God's people. That's what you're learning to do. Okay. Thou shalt not worship your business or your work, but thou shalt not be lazy either or complacent or do meaningless work. 
Rhythms of Grace. That's what that is. Okay, let me move to number four. I'm going to move us to number four. The last shape, the last conversation thing, the last thing that helps you enter spiritual conversations. Um, this one is a missions tool. So it's, it's, it's more of a tool that will help you as you start to do outreach. Uh, when you do evangelism, when you do social justice, it's called the octagon, and it's about the person of peace. I've loved this one. It's a very interesting one. The person of peace. Um, and, and, and I'm going to explain a bit about the shape, but let me first talk about the scripture. It's also in Luke, Luke chapter 10, and it's verse 1 to 12. Luke chapter 10, verse 1 to 12. So it's a bit of a reading, but we're going to read it anyway. It says, After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them out two by two before his face in every city and place where he himself was about to go. So Jesus is going to preach in those cities, but he sends these guys out as like, like uh, curtain raisers. Like you guys go and start, just warm up the place, I'm coming. He sends them out two by two. And he said to them, The harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray that the Lord of the harvest will send out laborers into his harvest. We talked about this verse earlier. It's like, as you go, pray for laborers in all those places. God is interested in not just disciples who hang out in a little group together. He wants everyone in that group to become a laborer. So it's like, pray for your people, guys. Pray for your discipleship group because Jesus is, Jesus is saying the harvest is always more plenty than the laborers. And so we need to always be constantly praying for and raising laborers. And then he said, go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. It's not going to be easy. You're going to find some challenges. There will be some people who will oppose you. There will be some people who will persecute you as you go. Be aware of that. And then what he says next is really crazy. Because you're going to the place where there are lambs among wolves. You should carry guns. You should carry swords. You should carry money. He says, carry neither money bag, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the road. Eish. Like you're sending us to where there are wolves and we're not even wearing shoes to run away from the wolves. <laughs> like what kind of command is that? He says, but whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. So you've come, you have nothing, you just show up and you're like, peace to this house. Speak, st always start with blessing. You always come in with blessing. And he says, if a son of peace, so that's a word you see there, if a son of peace. Uh, some versions say a man of peace. Other versions say a person of peace. If a, if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. So when you say, peace be upon this house, if there's a man of peace in that house, if there's a woman of peace in that house, your blessing will stick. Listen, God has given you the power to bless, even strangers. But he's saying, if there's a person who receives that word well, the, the prophet's reward falls on them. The missionary reward falls on them. The blessing will rest on that house. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. Very powerful word here. Because he's saying, listen, when you share the gospel and people bless you, that's okay. Many of you will receive blessings from people and you've never been used to being blessed. People will understand spiritually that you're playing such an important, incredible role in their lives. And they will bless you. And Jesus says, by the way, because you're not carrying anything, receive. I'm a, like, like, Whatever you find in that mission field, I've already provided for you to receive. And he says, whatever city you enter and, and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. Uh, let's go to verse 9. And heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. Remember that dual thing? We heal the sick, we, pray for, we, we, we proclaim the kingdom. So healing the sick is a very important part of sharing the gospel. Whenever you share the gospel, pray for the sick also. Pray that God, whatever, anybody's sick, can I pray for you? Just pray. Because God, let me tell you, miracles are first for unbelievers. We already believe Jesus. Miracles and whenever God heals me, like even his healing. Do you remember the guy who was healed the most of all in the Bible? He was called Lazarus. He was healed of death. <laughs> but guess what? He died again. There's no permanent healing on earth. So healing is not for me because where I'm going, I'm going to get a better body. And that body is going to be imperishable. It'll be amazing. It'll be beautiful. By the way, when you see me in heaven, you'll fall down. If you saw me in heaven and you saw my heavenly body right now, you'd all fall down and start worshipping. I'm going to be so smashing. I'll be, I'm going to look so amazing. I'll just be a hunk. It's, it's a truth. It's a truth. And by the way, that's how it is. If you listen to any of those near-death experiences where people talk about when they went to heaven and they saw some of the saints who had gone before, they always say they were shocked by the beauty. 
Your heavenly body, the imperishable body that God has for you is incredible. If you, if you could see it, you'd even say, ah, even if my hand is broken, let it stay. I'm getting a better one. You know, it's like you have a small, ka, 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 ka small ka, car which is breaking down. And yet you've seen your Maybach, your Mercedes that you're going to have in another five years. And then somebody tells you, can I give you my, my, my uh, Suzuki now? Just, ah, it's okay, let me just drive this one. Don't even spoil me for the one I'm getting. You, you understand what I'm saying? It's like you will have a better... So miracles are not for us. They are proof for unbelievers. That when they come in, they will see what God has done. When, whenever Pastor Milton talks about that leg that was healed today, glory to God. Yeah. Many people will come to Christ because it's his testimony. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So, so pray. Always pray for healing. Because when God answers, many, many people will hear about it. That was Jesus' technique as well. He went into a city, prayed for healing. People came. People heard and they came. And so he says, what, uh, whatever, whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, <laughs> this is a negative part. Go out into its streets and say, verse 11, the very dust of your city which clings to us, we now wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, the kingdom of God has come near you. And then verse 12, but I say to you, it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. So I'm like, you guys, the kingdom of God was close to your house, but you've rejected me. Your judgment is coming. It's not me you rejected. You rejected the kingdom of God. That removes my fear of somebody saying no to me when I'm doing evangelism. Because who have you said no to? You've said no to the king of kings. Yeah, it's not me you've said no to. So I don't fear rejection by people because it's not me they're rejecting. So here's the thing about the person of peace that I wanted you to see in that verse. Because Jesus says, I'm not sending you out with anything. He sends us out as missionaries. And the problem for us is many times when God says, like I've been saying, you're called. God wants you to go. There's a kalite here that sounds like it's about to explode. It's making people nervous. Can you turn it off? <laughs> so, so, so anyway, pay attention. God wants us to go as missionaries. And when, when I say, when Pastor M says we're all called, you say amen, but inside you're like, I, maybe, maybe, maybe it's these ones. Maybe it's the one sitting next to me. Because why are you saying? You're saying, number one, I have to work a little more. Let me make a bit of money. I'm broke. I'm too young. I'm too new in the faith. I don't know enough. Let me study more, then I'll know more, and I'll be able to do more. Anybody ever thought like that? It's like, I'm not qualified. I'm not qualified. I'm not the one. I just gave my life to Christ the other day. Other people have known Christ for a long time. Let them go. I'll go in there when I'm like them. But here's the thing. Jesus set up a missions model that required you to have nothing. He's just met these guys, and then he tells them, go. And it requires them to go out with nothing. Nothing in their pockets. They don't need, that's, he doesn't want them to depend on what they have. That's the point there. He doesn't want you to go out because you, are, you have a theological degree. He doesn't want you go, to go out because you have a title called pastor. He doesn't want you to go out because you're rich and your business is now settled. He wants, to go out, he wants you to go with nothing because it's a spirit who is going to convict people, none of your tools. That's how God is calling us to go. He doesn't need anything from us. So, so as we're going, it's like you don't tell God, Lord, I, I, I'll go. But let me have more money. He's like, no, 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 no. Go as you are. Right now, everyone here, you're qualified to go. You're qualified to be a missionary. You're qualified to share the gospel with people. And, that, and we are going. <laughs> so instead, what Jesus did, he even banned the carrying of things. He banned them from carrying things with them. And he said, don't carry things. He said, by the way, can I have my computer cable? I think my computer's going off. He said, don't carry things with them. He said, don't depend on what you have. Instead, he said, go, with, go by faith. Just go as you are. Then he gave them the principle of the person of peace. He said, when you go there, you will find the resources for the mission field are in the mission field. And how, is he going to find, how are you going to find it? Because you'll find a person called a person of peace. So whatever you're going, in the office, as you're starting to share the gospel, God will show you the man of peace in that office. Or the woman of peace. There will be another person who will just be a door opener for you. And that person will help you. Whenever you go around, like I, I told you, I shared with you how we went to Great Wall uh, with Pastor James. And we found a family that was a visitor here. And that family is already our people of peace. They are our person of peace in this season. And so when you, find that, when you find that person of peace, you lean on them. They will provide the resources. And so God is teaching us a very powerful tool. Whenever you're doing mission, whenever you're thinking about serving God, who is your person of peace? 
One of the people in your discipleship group is a person of peace to an estate around you. Yeah, they have strings, they have connections. They know the head of the estate committee. And that person, if they have the conversation with that person through their networks, that, that, that estate will be opened up to you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So who's that man of peace? You know, it's very interesting because God will always provide a person of peace in the mission field to look after you. And there's always somebody God has prepared. So what you have to do is have the eyes to understand the person of peace. Just show the, show the picture of the person of peace, uh, the, 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 the shape, the octagon. If you look at that octagon, you're going to see it looks like uh, a keyhole, isn't it? It looks like a keyhole, the old ones that have a key in it. But it also has a little head over there with shoulders that is a person. And what God is saying is God will always give you somebody who has the keys for the mission field. He'll always give you those people. And Jesus has some great examples. Matthew 11, verse 1 to 3. It's when uh, they came to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of his disciples, verse 2, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And verse 3, If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it and will send it back shortly. Oh, come on, somebody. It's like Jesus is going and he's like, just go, you'll find a donkey. And that donkey, just say the Lord needs it. We have to learn to be bold, God's people. We have to learn to, be, to ask for things for God's kingdom. Yeah. Uh, when we do what we call the Leadership Academy, uh, and by the way, if you've not done the, the boot camp, the Leadership Boot Camp, you need to sign up for it. There's still an opportunity. We still are, are, are taking some students. It's a one-year uh, leadership experience uh, that trains you to become a, a, a multiplying marketplace leader. You can talk to Pastor Carol uh, if you want more information. Uh, or, or talk to your campus pastor, actually. Talk to your campus pastor, even better. And, and what we tell people is, we, we, we ask them to do quite a few things that cost money in that course, including buying an air ticket to Kampala and back. And by, by the way, those costs, they're quite high. And it's a lot of young people also take the course. And we tell them, here's a one th rule. You don't use your own money for this course. We want you to raise it. We want you to talk to people and share your vision. We want you to learn not to be afraid of asking people to give to God's work. Because when you're in this course, you're doing God's work. So we teach our people to do that. And people are always terrified because they don't like... Who likes asking for money? Let me just see, show of hands. There's usually at least one person who's a fundraiser for a career. <laughs> you know, <laughs> not even one here. Most of us don't like asking for money, isn't it? It's like you're shy to ask. You feel like you're begging. But it's because you've not understood. You're not giving to me. You're giving to God's work. When I preached to Hill City this week and I told them about Free the Future, I said, the reason I'm not afraid to ask for that money is because it's not for me. It's not for me. It's for God's work. And because of that, I can ask you freely because I know when you give, you'll be blessed. So when I find that person of peace and I say, can I stay in your house? And they treat me and they bless me. Guess what they're going to get? They're going to get a prophet's reward. Yeah, they will because I'm on God's mission. So Jesus is like, untie the colt. <laughs> Bring it. If they ask you who it is, say the master needs it. Say God needs it. It's for God's work. And so this is a very important principle. I found it very useful because when people understand this, you're going to find there's somebody in your discipleship group who's a person of peace. They have a big house that all of you can meet in. And maybe you need to stop circulating and going around each other's houses because they're not all the same size. But you, you're the man of peace. You're the one whose, whose house in this estate we can use to have meetings in. Don't be afraid to ask for it. Say, the master needs it. I'm teaching you the a principle of spiritual authority here. Ask, and it will be given. Ask, and it will be given. By the way, I never used to ask for things. I used to be so shy to ask. I would feel like I'm asking for myself. I've, I've subsequently learned to be very bold in my asks. I thought I was bold, but nowadays I'm becoming very bold in my asks. Uh, and it's because I'm understanding the principle of spiritual authority. Uh, Luke chapter 22, verse 7 to 12. Uh, it says, They came the feast of unleavened bread, the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamp had to be sacrificed. Verse 8. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Verse 9. Uh, Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. So it's like, Okay, Jesus, we've just entered a city. We're not from this city. You're telling us to go and make preparations. Where are we going to eat? And verse 10, he replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters. Verse 11, And say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room that I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And verse 12, He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. 
I love Jesus' confidence. He's like, there's a guy in this town who has a really nice place. Uh, go and ask him. Tell him we're going to have our Passover meal there. He has guts, eh? Yeah, he just asks. But it's the, for the father's business. God has important business to do, so why can't I ask you to give up your nice car for us to do this mission with? Why can't I ask you to give, your ni- give up your nice house for us to have our, DG- our discipleship group meeting, to have our college students meeting in? Ask people for things, guys. Uh, this is what the man of... And pray for a man of peace in the things you're doing. Again, it's another business principle. When God is sending you to a new country to start your business, pray for a man of peace. Pray for somebody who has your same values, somebody who loves God like you and who won't be compromised, and pray that that person will be a person of peace to open up your business expansion. Uh, this, it's a spiritual principle, and it works. It works. Now, I want to just, uh, having said, said all these things, you're going to find that um, the tools that I'm giving you are tools of faith. They're tools of faith. These are, these, these are, God has given us the keys. He's given us the tools but we have to use them. You have to start practicing. You have to start practicing how to have that conversation of the Kairos moment. Start it with your kids even today (laughs) or in in the place where you're staying. Start listening carefully and hearing what God wants uh, and and, and asking the right questions. Uh, When it comes to the triangle, start assessing yourself or your group that you're leading, the ministry you're leading. Uh, How are we doing in our relationships, our critical relationships? And start seeing what God is saying there. Uh, number three, when it comes to um, the pendulum, maybe even start with a self-assessment. Before I lead my people, how am I doing? Am I one of those people who is just harassed, helpless, like a sheep without a shepherd? Bishop Oscar used to say, many Christians, Jesus said that I am the, I am the good shepherd. But for many Christians, if you see them, you'd think that they're led by a bad goat herd. <laughs> you know, shepherds, they used to walk in Israel and the sheep follow them, calmly. But in Africa, we have goat herds. And you look at them and you say, that one, his God, his God must be a bad goat herd. You're a bad representation of God by your life. And maybe it's a place, first of all, for repentance for you. And then now something that you can help to challenge people. And then who are the men of peace and the women of peace who have the resources for you to do ministry? They have the resources for you to do discipleship. And maybe you're overlooking those because you're waiting for the day you'll have those resources. Uh, God has already given you all the resources you need to do his work. You just have to open your eyes and pray for that man of peace. Amen? Amen. Is this a conversation that's useful? Yeah. I'm giving you pastoral tools. I'm treating you like pastors. I'm treating you like men of God and women of God. Because you're going to lead God's people. Some of you are going to lead children in your estates. Some of you are going to lead your nephews and nieces. Your family will never be lost again when you're there. How can they be lost and you have the tools of the kingdom in your hands? Some of you are going to change your estate because you're going to infiltrate it and you're going to start a group that's going to change people's lives. And your discipleship groups are going to be full. I speak over all of you multiplication. I speak all over all of you. Come on, stand up and receive God's word right now. I speak over all of you fruitfulness. Your spiritual life is going to be fruitful. You know, this year I talked about the fact that God wants your faith to grow so much. This is his desire. Guess what? Part of your faith growing is fruitfulness. Part of why you're going to have so much joy this year. I said that this is a year of joy. Part of your biggest joy will not be the big promotion God gives you. It will come from the fact that you're doing the will of God. The disciples came back full of joy. And they said, we saw Satan falling down as lightning from heaven. Part of your joy this year is you're going to see Satan falling down as lightning from people's lives. People are going to be freed because of you. And you'll be filled with so much joy. You'll be like, what else would I rather do than doing my father's business? And so I speak a blessing over you, God's people. Hey, come on, just receive blessing right now. Just say, Lord, I receive this blessing. I am, I am, I am, I am a good workman. I am a workman approved. I am ready to do your work. I receive the miracle of God in my life. I am receiving confidence right now. I will never look down on myself. There's someone who's been looking down on yourself right now. You've been feeling so unqualified. You've been feeling like you don't deserve God to work through you. You're not ready yet. And right now, I want you to just confess it right now. Just say, Lord, I'm so sorry for doubting you. I'm so sorry because I thought it was about me. But it's not about me, it's about you. I cannot doubt the God who is in me. And so right now, I just receive your enabling. I say, forgive me for my sinful doubting. And Lord, I will use what you've given me. I don't have to be an expert. I'll use what you've given me and I will serve you. Father God, thank you for equipping your people. Thank you for giving them strength. Thank you for building them up. And Lord Jesus, even as we go out for our lunch and as we prepare for the afternoon, 
hey Lord, this is a season, this is a time. This is our time. Let me tell you guys, there's something that happens as you lean into God's presence. There's something that happens as you lean into God's presence. When you come in with your own energy, you have so much energy and fire. Then a place begins to happen when you start getting weary. You start getting tired. Don't despair. That's not a bad thing. Because what happens is your, your guards begin to fall. And the Holy Spirit is able to work. And so Father, right now, even as we're entering this day too, the harder part, as we're beginning to lean into this transformation, Lord, our guards are falling. We're actually getting ready for you to use us. I'm praying that, Lord, you will surprise us. The best is before us. Uh, Lord, there's so much ahead of us. We receive it right now. And Lord, I'm thanking you because the, the testimonies we're yet to hear in this, in this gathering are so much bigger than the ones we've had even so far. And so, Lord, I'm just thanking you. I'm praying that as we eat this lunch, protect it to our bodies. And Lord, I'm praying for everyone who struggled eating food right now because of any condition. I'm praying over you right now in Jesus' name. You will enjoy the meal. You will not have that problem with your stomach in Jesus' name. I speak over you right now that your stomach will function as it should. It will function as, you, as it should. And I speak over you that the Lord is just delivering you right now. In fact, not just for this retreat, but I'm speaking over you that permanently going forward, the Lord will help you enjoy the food that He has for you. I speak blessing over you, God's people. Enjoy your lunch in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.